Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios, Sumil Thapa and James Andrews, both of Oceanit. Uh, we're going to be talking about some very interesting, very likable science, uh, a product mainly called HeatX. So, and this is, what would, what would you call a HeatX as a, as a substance? Um, well, it's an it's a omniphobic, low surface energy, slick uh, surface treatment. Okay, so now let's break that down. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of words. Okay. Yeah. Um, omniphobic, so it, it, it doesn't like water and it doesn't like oil. Yeah. It, it hates everything. Basically. It repels right. both, both of those substances. Right, which is very unusual. Most things that are hydrophobic tend to bond to oil pretty well yeah. and vice versa. If they like oil, they, they drive away water or stay away from water. But, but this, this is omniphobic, which is, is very, very cool, right? It's very... I think we actually have a, our first photo actually shows uh, a little of, of this omniphobic nature of it, right? Yeah, uh, so the first photo um, so is just it's zoomed sand. in on grains of sand, and a droplet of water, water on the left, and oil on the right, right, just showing those repelling properties of the surface treatment. Right, both, both are beaded up instead of mm -hmm. sinking yeah. into the sand. So that, that's great, that's great. And this came out of some work that you were doing uh, initially on... For the Navy. For the Navy on, on anti-fouling yeah. or... The, yeah, so um, invasive species are okay. a problem for any ships that travel around the world, but I think the Navy was primarily interested in the drag aspect, sure. um, burning more fuel, and the more growth you have on the bottom of your vessel, the more drag you have, and therefore the less efficient you are moving through the water. So I think their primary concern was, um, was the low friction properties. Um, but then... Correct me if I'm wrong, Samuel, but there's also a, um, an anti-fouling uh, issue kind of globally with shipping where most ships uh, used to use ablative copper paints that were biocidal, meaning they would kill off the organisms that tried to stick to the hull. Um, so leach, leaching out copper out of the paint. As right, yeah. to, to kill those microorganisms, right. yeah. Um, and in the U.S. and many other countries uh, in the West, uh, it became illegal to use that on a large commercial scale. Right. Um, so there was kind of two ways at which this uh, Navy project kind of originated. I see. Yeah. So then you developed a, a substance that doesn't have copper and is non-toxic in, in any way, but also its surface is extremely smooth, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that means it's just much harder for anything to get a grip on it. Right. Yeah. right. So we're like Teflon-ish, except even more so, right? Even smoother than Teflon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool, um, and that became that became sort of one line of the products for the ships, and the thing you guys call Foulex, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Yeah. But then at some point, somebody realized that the same issue applied to a whole other piece of, of uh, the work or a whole other area of industry, right? Right. Yeah. So heat exchangers, right. um, which are a kind of ubiquitous piece of equipment that not a lot of people know, right, is out there and everywhere in manufacturing processes, power producing uh, facilities, refineries, food processing, yeah. chemical factories, things like that. So you, if, even your car has a radiator so, yeah. as a heat exchanger. So yeah. if we jump to the third photo here, actually, uh, we'll see something of a, of a heat exchanger. Yeah, so these are, all these big things are heat exchangers, yeah. right? These are industrial heat exchangers. And uh, this is at a uh, heat plant or something, or? Some, some large, large facility, but yeah. yeah. But basically, they're designed to just what they say: exchange heat with the environment, so that they, they're right. used to cool things down that are that are very, very hot. Right. Yeah. yeah. Generally, you'll have a fluid of some kind um, that is really hot from some sort of industrial process that you're doing at your facility, and you need to cool that in order right. to keep the process cycle going. Right. In a so you'll bring in a refrigerator or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Sure. And you'll bring in another fluid that's cooler, and the, the, the unit exchanges the heat. Right, and the video that we have uh, actually sort of shows that in, in a diagrammatic way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a schematic way here. I, uh, so all of the tubes that you saw um, in that last picture, you'll see in this video animation that we brought. Um, basically, if you're using a coolant, often it's ocean water, river water mm -hmm. um, from nearby. It doesn't contact the thing that it's cooling, right. um, but it comes in, it's, as it moves through this exchanger, you'll see that it's designed to cool it. However, if you're using unprocessed water to cool, you start growing biofouling inside there, 
Right. Um, so this is a zoom in on the tubular surface. And because it's a warm, nice environment for microbes, they start binding to the surface of the tubes and basically clogging it up. Um, so HEDEX was developed to repel that growth, not let it stick. So not kill it like a biocide, but rather keep it from binding to the surface. Repel it, let it move through, not build up, and therefore you preserve the heat exchanger property. So on the top here, you can see if you get a layer of biofouling, heat can't really transfer through the surface, whereas on the bottom, it's moving freely and the exchanger is serving the purpose it's yeah. meant to serve. Yeah. And yeah, and heat exchangers, as you were saying, are really used in a lot of different applications on small scale mm -hmm. up to very large scales. And um, one of your big uses of them or, or here on the island is at the Hawaii Electric Company, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who basically is using cold seawater to cool mm -hmm. hot fluids, right? Yeah. And, yeah. So for the HECO plant, um, they, they use seawater as, as their cooling. And, you know, of course, you want to keep the seawater clean, um, but it, it's like a, like a boat. You know, if you're flowing seawater through tubes, it's going to build up a layer of, of fouling barnacles and, and algae and right. stuff like that. And so HEDEX is a solution to keep, keep the tubes flowing. Right. Keep mm -hmm. everything, yeah, so they, they don't have to, uh, your pumps work, yeah. work more easily. And then you don't have to shut down as much to clean. Right, right. So that, that's a very, very interesting idea. And... Uh, it clearly has uh, tremendous uh, implications, right, for, for how much power HECO can produce, how much, how much power they're actually using to produce the power. Right, how right. much fuel they're burning. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the HECO facility that we ran our first trial at is out in Kahi, okay. here on the leeward side. I think we brought a picture of it. They basically okay. bring in unprocessed ocean water, okay, from uh, run it through a set of heat exchangers, and then let it out again. Um, and they're cooling a, uh, a process fluid on their side that keeps the turbines spinning and creating energy. Um, but the fouling that they encounter because of this kind of rich marine water right. means that they typically had to take a heat exchanger offline every six months okay. uh, to clean it completely, do a whole maintenance cycle, then put it back into Which use. Which means really taking the whole thing apart. Taking yeah. the whole thing down spinning up a replacement turbine that mm -hmm. is less efficient even, so it needs to burn more fuel to create mm -hmm. the same amount of energy. Um, and of course, it's man, man hours that they're spending to do that for every heat exchanger. And they actually have a relatively small facility, but yeah. some power plants um, on the mainland have hundreds, if not thousands of heat exchangers running across different processes. Huh. So that, that could be, you begin to see that this, this is a, uh, uh, process or a project that could have significant impact, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because the, the, the scale, once you begin to scale it up, it is, you know, you're saving just a little bit of time, a little bit of energy here. But mm -hmm. even here, it, it seemed there was quite, quite a bit of uh, savings because, as you said, it, it's, uh, they had to shut, shut down an untreated heat exchanger every six, six months. months, and it's about a two or three day process. Something of that nature, right. yeah. Um, and they would have to do that, of course, across each of the exchangers that they have, and that's basically a constant process that they never are finished doing. You start again from the beginning mm -hmm. as soon as you're done with the last one. So mm -hmm. using HEDEX, they were able to keep one of their exchangers in service for 26 months oh. without a full maintenance cycle. Oh. Um, so they took it out to inspect it, saw, oh, it's clean, put it back into service. Oh. Um, and now how many do we have? We have, we have two heat exchangers that have been treated, and we're looking at uh, doing maybe another one or two, mm -hmm. and looking at some other component oh. areas that could use this type oh. of, of treatment. So you're saying that essentially extends the interval between cleanings at least something like five times. Yeah. So, so yeah. saving a huge amount of downtime for, for the uh, yeah. HECO, a large amount of person hours in terms of cleaning the things out and, and mm -hmm. removing all the biofilm, yeah. saving energy because they're, they're not having to run other uh, turbines to replace them, right? Right. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a big cost impact for them, right. but it's also a big uh, ecological impact for everybody else because the pumping power and spinning up a backup turbine to generate that electricity is very inefficient. Um, if we can keep the flow and the heat transfer stable, basically we're 
we're saving on all that additional burn of fuel and uh, we're preserving the heat transfer capabilities. So we're keeping their, uh, their cycle cooler overall. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps everything just be more ecologically friendly. It all adds up to mm -hmm. uh, less carbon being put into the atmosphere. And it's, it's a non-trivial amount too, right? I mean, even just from this one installation that, you, that you've done, right? That they've gotten, they're estimating some, I forget what the figures you gave me were, but. Yeah, uh, so it will, they're their figures. I think over, over a five year period on a single exchanger, they estimated $1.5 million of savings. Wow. Uh, that was a number from them. Mm -hmm. um, and then looking at if we were to roll that out slowly across all of their facilities, what the impact would be for the islands. Um, and I think the materials team came to a number of something like 39,000 cars fewer on our roads. That's the equivalent gasoline burn. It's something like 20 million gallons of gasoline saved per year in terms of what the emissions saved from this. Oh, car. That's, that's incredible. It's, it's great stuff. And it's, it's a really nice example here of Mm -hmm. Looking, uh, taking one of the things Ocean it does, right? Yeah. Somebody had this idea, and you guys have turned this into a product now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the the big thing is about increasing efficiency, right? And keeping it keeping equipment running at the best possible output, so you maximize the amount of energy you get per unit of of, yeah. of fuel that you're burning. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. by by making the process completely more efficient, you reduce the amount of total fuel you're burning and reduce the amount of emissions you make. Yeah, and it's something people don't think about so much. Uh, it, it, you know, people, everyone's talking about, let's go to solar and wind power and wave mm -hmm. power and all. But we realistically, we're stuck in a carbon-based economy for a while, and we're going to continue to use carbon-based fuels. <clears throat> they need to be tra transitioned out, perhaps. But Yeah, well, well, the transition is starting, <clears throat> right. thankfully. And, and, yeah, yeah, but, but um, what you've done has gotten a very nice way to, to drop their use, make everything more efficient while we're doing that. Right. Yeah. It's something that can help us today yeah. and yeah. is helping us now. Exactly. It's, it's part of the equation. I mean, yeah. you know, when you want to get, as you get more towards renewables, right. you also want to be more efficient about how you use the resources that you're currently expending. Exactly. We're going to dig into this more deeply, but right now we're going to take a, a brief break. Uh, Sumil James from Oceanit, and I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and Likeable Science will be back in one minute. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. And you're back here with Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, talking today with Jay Andrews and Sumil Fapa from Oceanet, all about their HeatX, <coughs> which is a, a very slick solution, uh, a, a thin, very slippery coating that they can put on pipes of all sorts, and uh, particular pipes that you're running seawater through, mm -hmm. uh, which tend to <coughs> get so-called biofouling. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have a picture, I think, of what biofouling really looks like. Um, people might not be familiar with that concept. And here's a heat exchanger, part of a heat exchanger with barnacles growing on it, and you can see inside yeah. it. It's so this is the actual heat exchanger at the Kahe power plant. At six months. After six, six months. months. So every six months they do a clean, they scrape all of this off, right. get it ream, down. Ream those things and out. And then yeah. six months later you see barnacles growing. Um, sometimes it gets even big enough that it'll completely block the tubes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even yeah. there, you can see, I mean, that's going to be reducing the diameter of that tube, yeah. slowing down the flow of water. So it's Yeah, and it's a, it's a process that speeds up because once you have the microorganisms form a film, right. then the macroorganisms, <coughs> the larger things, can start adhering as well to that biofilm right. that's already once there. They're, once yeah. they're in place, yeah. that slows the water down, gives more things a chance to settle in there, more right. things can grow. It yeah. slows it down and then right. acts as an insulator right. to make the heat exchanger less efficient. Right. And then in contrast, the next photo that we had shows this is a, a similar heat exchanger, but this is after 26 months of this service? Is the exact same heat exchanger, actually. Right, okay. And this is, after 26 months, they wanted to inspect it to see how it was performing. Mm -hmm. 
And so this is what it looks like after a quick wipe clean. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, yeah, so they didn't have to chemically so, clean it or anything. Yeah, so almost just, five times as long and with just nothing sticking to it really, essentially. And going. Yeah. I think that they've now put this back in service. Yeah, it's back to. in service. Yeah. yeah. So this is with HEDEX. You can see the, yeah. the biofouling just can't really adhere at all. Yeah, that's, that's stunning. And uh, we were talking before the break about the, the impacts of this. <clears throat> you had some figures here that uh, uh, improve genera generation cycles by 2.5%, leading to 8.2% reduction in amount of fuels. Uh, <clears throat> they're saying that's equivalent to 144 million fewer tons of emissions in the US, 144 million tons of carbon yeah. emissions. So I think that those numbers are with right. uh, condensers, right. which we can oh. talk about in a little bit. Sorry. Okay, yeah. um, right. But the, but the uh, effect of the heat exchangers uh, part, I think we calculated it for the state of Hawaii, just okay. for uh, Hawaiian electric facilities. Mm -hmm. at, 182,000 tons, which right. is still a lot. Right. It's not in the per millions, year, but per year, yeah. <laughs> per year, for Hawaii, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for Hawaii, which is huge for the state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that, as you said earlier, that's two million cars, basically. Uh, right, two million gallons. Sorry, two 20, million yeah. gallons of gasoline. Right. Twenty million gallons of gasoline. Sorry, got the figures wrong. Um, but yeah, it's still a massive impact yeah, for yeah. us, and it's uh, you know a place that we want to preserve. So. Um, being our home, we don't want to be polluting yeah. at the rates that we are, and knowing that we're not going to be switching to renewables in the next few years anyway, right. Uh, right. it's quite important. Yeah, yeah. Everything uh, to do to ramp up in efficiency, ramp down the use of, of fossil fuels is great, and this this is a, clearly sort of a, a huge step actually towards yeah. doing that. So that's, that's again, it's a very impressive thing. So yeah, I, I inadvertently jumped ahead to, to talk about condensers. So let's let's talk a little bit about condensers because yeah. again, right like heat exchangers, I suspect a lot of folks, including me, don't really understand why condensers are used, how widely they're used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, condensers are similar to heat exchangers in that, um, at least the ones in Kahe, they'll use seawater to to cool, um, or they'll use use water to cool it and. But with condensers, it actually operates as part of the power generation process. So with a you know, typical power cycle, you, you heat up water you, to produce steam, and that steam runs a turbine that's generating power. Right. And um, once you've passed it through the turbine, it goes from superheated steam to saturated, kind of wet, what we call wet steam. And in order to complete the cycle, you need to remove that water to dry that steam so that you can run it through your process again and cycle through to generate power. And so in order to remove that moisture, you need to condense it. Okay. Uh, and that's why it's called a condenser. Okay. And so that condensation, you're basically using energy to cool it down and remove the water. Okay. And you want to maximize the efficiency of that unit. Okay. So again, you're sort of like the heat exchange you're running. Okay. You're running sea, mm -hmm. cold seawater over those hot pipes now to condense the right. water out. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's like leaving a, a can of Coke out on a hot day. Right. You start getting the condensation on the outside of the Coke. And you get a similar problem with insulation, but in this, this case, it's not biofouling, it's the water itself actually ends up forming a sheet along that surface. And the sheet of water is just not as efficient as little droplets at recondensing into uh, water that you can put back into your cycle to turn into steam again. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So th this allows it to... Yeah, so with the, the omniphobic property, and because it repels water in addition to other materials, um, it, it starts this process that we call dropwise condensation. Okay. So normally with a, a normal tube, like, like uh, James was saying, you have a, a film of water and you're condensing your water onto that film. Um, but with a slick surface that repels the water, instead of having a film, you have little droplets. And those droplets actually increase the surface area that you can have water condensing. Oh, okay. And before the droplet gets really big and coalesces into a large film, it actually falls off the tube. And so you expose the, okay. the metal surface again to collect more water. Oh, okay. Right. I see. Yeah. yeah, so what we found in testing is that the omniphobic coating will promote this dropwise condensation at a much higher rate than mm -hmm. just a kind of clean piece of metal would. Right. Um, and so therefore you're creating less back, or sorry, more back pressure that makes the cycle, the whole cycle, more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we get to the numbers that we calculated is I that see. we believe that a 2.5% efficiency savings on the electricity generation process mm -hmm. um, actually equates to over well over 8% uh, 
savings in the fuel you have to burn in order to generate that same exact amount of electricity. Oh, that's that's very, very impressive again. Yeah. Yeah. Very neat to see how the same product can play two different roles in two different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, so in the, in, the, in the heat exchanger, we're on the inside of the tube repelling biofouling. In the condenser scenario, we're on the outside, or what we call the shell side, okay. um, promoting this condensation and preventing a film okay. of water from forming. Huh, very, very neat, yeah. Because I know that uh, there's the traditional hydrophobic surfaces cause water to beat up, and, and for a lot of things, that's one solution. Mm -hmm. Other solutions for, to prevent that same kind of beating, though, is to use a super hydrophilic solution, right, a surface, right, yeah. and, and pull the droplets flat immediately so yeah. you get an even layer of water across things instead of droplets forming. Mm -hmm. But either, either way, it works fine. But the latter, the hydrophilic wouldn't work in your case nearly as well. Then. Right. Yeah. We're trying to prevent but, that film of water yeah, from yeah. insulating the whole, yeah. the whole tube. Yeah, no, very, very, very neat, very neat. And again, it, this works because this, you're putting on a very, very thin layer of this so it's not... Yeah not impacting the heat transfer at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this, so that's why this, uh, our HeatX technology is not what we would consider traditional coating technologies um, because it can go down as a, as a very thin, ultra-thin coating. Typically, for most coatings, you need to build a certain amount of thickness just to have the structural integrity of that coating mm -hmm. so that it doesn't you know, peel or bubble off. Uh -huh. uh, but with the HeatX uh, technology, we lay it on extra thin so that you minimize the impact on the heat transfer yeah. while yeah. still having that... That's functional surface. Hmm. So it must be quite uh, non-viscous then as, 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 a, as a paint, as yeah. it were, in, in its liquid form. Mm -hmm. no, no. Huh, very neat, very neat. So um, wh where do you see this going? You know, what's, 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 what's sort of the next steps in this? Yeah, so we're, we're trying <laughs> to expand it um, and, and use step by step. Um, part of the thing is when, when you're looking at new technology, especially in industry, you want to be very careful about how you approach and how quickly you, you expand. So, I mean, with HECO, our work was a really kind of using testing in low risk situations to make sure that it works mm -hmm. before going into higher, higher risk areas that have higher value. And, higher impact. Mm -hmm. And so now we're getting to the point with like the condenser work where we're looking, okay, we can make a much bigger impact if we start applying in, in that area of their, their facility. And uh, once we can demonstrate that it really makes the impact that we're mm -hmm. projecting, then, you know, start increasing application to other facilities. And uh -huh. So you're in the process of testing the, te testing the condenser part of this now with HECO? Yeah. And right. Hopefully getting good results. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the heat exchanger side is already kind of taking off, right? Um, which is great. I think even though things like coal are being used less and less in the U.S., they're still pretty uh, highly used uh, in the rest of the world. So we're working in multiple countries now uh, to do applications of HeatX on exchangers, and that's kind of our first, uh, mm -hmm. first area that we want to to expand beyond Hawaii and beyond the U.S. Oh, that's great. Um, you have a glo global yeah. impact to this product. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then if the yeah, we've done a no number of applications for the, the heat exchanger application mm -hmm. around the world now. Mm -hmm. huh. yeah. yeah, And then the condenser stuff, you're starting to test. And, and then you say that yeah. really is actually a, a larger part. So if you combine those two, you get a yeah. plant that's running much, right. much better. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I think... Uh, even burning the most efficient fuel that you have to burn, you're still barely getting to 50% efficiency. If we can improve that efficiency so that you're burning 8% less fuel, that's a number that would appeal to, I think, anybody oh, around yeah. the world to know that that much fuel could be saved to yeah. still generate the exact same amount of electricity. Absolutely, that, that's, that's extremely uh, significant for anyone's bottom line. The, yeah. the pollution it's putting out, the, the waste heat, yeah, all, all those things are, are going to be impacted. Uh, so that, that's that's wonderful. Mm. Um, but that's, and this is really, and then there's a whole other end of it that we talked about at the start, the, the anti-fouling, which again is saving ships yeah. fuel mm -hmm. and, and allowing faster transport of good and less downtime for the ships also, mm -hmm. too. So, it's a whole, yeah. so this product really is having sort of multifaceted impacts now, yeah, and, it's going uh, in lots of directions. Yeah. One that we haven't even spoken about is the corrosion aspect. Yeah. Um, that okay. it actually creates a passivating layer that arrests or halts corrosion and can um, apply on top of corrosion that's already there. Uh, to a certain extent, it basically seals it and stops it. So there's tons of 
uh, applications on that side of things that Samuel is involved in. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I was reading something like that in here. They, they, they said, yeah, you can, you can, that is, you take, take a ship that's already starting to rust on its hull yeah. and you don't really have to scrape it all totally clean. Yeah, and so that, that's the nice thing about having being an ultra thin coating is that um, we can repair kind of all infrastructure that's already in use and has some corrosion damage and, and extend the lifetime of, of all existing infrastructure. So, you know, take ships that are, that are already in service that are a little bit corroded and clean it up, remove all the loose kind of corrosion that might flake off. Right. And then once we get a decent layer, we can apply and because we're so thin, we'll cover all the cracks and crevices. And every, yeah, every little nook and cranny yeah. is, is now sealed. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, that, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, and it's not just marine, it's also cables, it's also rail cars, it's right. storage same, same tanks. Right, happening out, out yeah. all around. It's all uh, sorts of things that carry fluids that tend to mess things up or are in an environment that tends to be corrosive. Then, yeah, we're looking at how to fine-tune things for those specific environments. Wow, wow. This, is, this is really really interesting to see how a single good idea like this can branch out and have all these great impacts and really be helping the world in so many different ways. Yeah. Ocean is to be commended, and as are you guys individually. You. Uh, Samil, <laughs> James, thank you so much for being here. This, this has been really enlightening to me, and I'm sure our viewers have all learned a ton too. So thank, yeah. thank you all, and uh, best of luck. I'll, I'll get you back sometime to tell me more, more adventures of Ocean. Yeah, thanks thank for you. having us yeah. on here. Yeah. Aloha. <laughs>